This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, this is actually only my second time in New York. I'm, I'm from North Carolina. So as Larry mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Agronomy and Outreach for a company called Criticality. Uh, we're a vertically integrated processing company in the state of North Carolina, but we have operations in four states currently. Um, our partner uh, who purchased 40% of us back a couple of years ago is a company that you probably haven't heard of yet called Pixis International. Uh, they are a legacy tobacco company with operations in 30 different countries. Uh, they've got a grower network that really spans the globe and, and really having their partnership is what enables us to do what we do across the country and also uh, it helps with or being able to participate in research like Larry's. So it's been a lot of fun so far. And as Larry kind of alluded to, uh, one of the key things in achieving profitability and making sure that you don't lose money on him is finding a company that's trustworthy that you can contract with. So there is going to be a surplus this year, I can, I can assure you of that. Uh, however, a lot of that is because Several companies are out there contracting thousands and thousands of acres with no real commercialization plan. And understand that it takes a lot of money to commercialize that amount of acreage. As you're looking, as you're looking through this budget that I passed out, on the back page, there's, there's a table that assumes uh, about half a pound of floral material per plant. Uh, so about a thousand, about a thousand pounds of floral material per acre on our model that we're using in North Carolina. And you can see as your CBD percentages go up, this is assuming $3.50 per percentage point of CBD per pound. Um, you can see as those percentage points go up, uh, the monetary net value to the grower goes up pretty dramatically too. And taking a look at those gross numbers, so this is on a per acre basis. So. If you had growers that were achieving 1,000 pounds of floral material per acre at 10% CBD, I as a company have to pay out $35,000 per acre. Now, think about that for a second. So, my company has to shell out $35,000 per acre. So, if we're contracting 1,000 acres, what does my uh, cash flow situation have to look like to be able to pay you, the grower? So that's, that's problematic. So honestly, the first thing that you as a grower need to do uh, to achieve profitability in your crop is sign a contract with a company that you know has, has the monetary resources to pay you at the end of the season. It's been a huge problem in North Carolina. I would say probably 40 to 50% of growers over the past two years have not been paid for their crop. And a lot of them are still sitting on it. Now, in a lot of situations, you can get sort of uh, pulled into a situation where you are going to get paid, but maybe you're getting paid half in oil. Well, and, and that's fine if you have a commercialization plan for that oil. If you're planning on starting your own brand, something like that, uh, that, that might be fine in your business model. But understand, if you're planning on supplying that oil as a raw ingredient, to a formulator, generally speaking, formulators that are buying dramatic amounts of uh, raw ingredients don't want to piecemeal it from farm to farm. And then another thing that you have to take into account is the looming regulation. Once the FDA gets involved with this, everybody's, everybody who's manufacturing products from these, uh, from these oils is going to have to comply with 21 CFR Part 111 or Part 117, whichever it, whichever it shakes out to be. And there's a cost associated with that regulatory burden, and it's not an insignificant cost. So as you're planning what you're gonna do with your farm, just make sure you're taking these things into account in your business model. And, and this is not a cheap crop to raise. Uh, you can look through here in this budget, and assuming $4 per plant, if you're on a four by six spacing, which is typical down in North Carolina, depending on your planting date, just your plant cost per acre is going to run you $7,200. That's on a per acre basis, folks. So this is not a cheap crop to raise if you're raising it for CBD. Uh, then you get into things like 
analytical testing fees. So we have $300 down here for analytical testing fees. I would assume that if you're doing it right, you're probably going to spend significantly more than that $300 on those testing fees. But then, if you go over to the next page, where it really gets, uh, here, here's where on your farm you can make the most impact in your cost of production right now, and that's on labor costs. So there are a lot of in innovative things coming out right now. Uh, Granville Equipment, which anyone here familiar with a company called Granville Equipment? I figured probably not. They're big in the tobacco space, so they're out of Roxborough, North Carolina. They recently came up with a piece of equipment that essentially uh, bucks the crop on a massive scale. Uh, so it, it dramatically mechanizes the operation as far as removing the floral material from the stalks. And you can see in here, so your total labor cost, if you're doing everything by hand, and all of these numbers were generated from sitting down with our growers and putting a really sharp pencil to what their costs were over the past couple of years. So you can see, if you're doing everything by hand, you're looking at $4,170 as far as your labor costs from start to finish. That Granville piece of equipment cuts your labor costs down to $1,357.50. Now, that's a dramatic savings. Understand that that piece of equipment costs $42,000, but just in labor savings alone, if you have 15 acres of hemp out in the field, that piece of equipment pays for itself year one in labor savings alone. This market is going to continue to commoditize. As these products become more readily available, uh, as more material comes onto the market, the price is going to continue to go down. So you as a grower need to be thinking right now how you are going to reduce your cost in producing this crop over the next few years. And some of, the, some of, those, some of those input costs are starting to take care of themselves. We've seen in North Carolina clones go from up to $14 a plant in 2016, the first year of our program, down to $4 a plant this year. Now, a lot of that was collective negotiating on, on our part for our grower base, but understand those, pr those prices are coming down. And honestly, I feel, I feel that the biggest way to cut your cost in plants right now is to go to seed. There are a number of reputable seed companies out there producing high CBD seed. Oregon CBD happens to be uh, what a lot of our growers are using currently. Uh, but going from seed and going from even a $4 clone to a dollar seed is a dramatic savings for your farm. Now understand that, uh, and I don't, know, I don't know if Larry's tried it at all, but uh, nobody that I know of has had success in direct seeding these. So that dollar per plant is not gonna be your all-in cost in your plants. Uh, generally speaking, you're gonna have to make a transplant out of those seeds. But even if you're a dollar twenty-five in it, all in, that's better than four dollars per plant. So mechanization, plant costs, that is the those are the two biggest ways right now that you as a grower can start dropping your cost in this crop. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions on that? What was the name of the machine again? So Granville Equipment is the company, and it's actually got it on here. Uh, I think they're just calling it their Hemp Thrasher, but they have a website. Um, if you Google them, it'll pull it right up. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I, Oregon CBD takes a lot of pride in what they do. They only put out F1 seeds, and their varieties uh, have, in multiple states, met that legal threshold for several years now. And, and that, brings up, that brings up a good point, because you can get online right now and find 15 different seed companies. Uh, how do you know which of them are reputable? Well, that's kind of difficult right now. I'll tell you that Oregon CBD, twice this past year, crashed their website and made $8 million in three minutes uh, when they released seed onto their website. That tells me that they're probably fairly reputable. Uh, they have actual sales. We have folks that have these varieties out in the field right now, and they've performed well the past couple of years. So as you're going through your vetting process for your farm, 
Uh, just do as much research as possible as to who's grown those varieties, who's bought seed from that company, because there are a lot of horror stories out there right now. Are some growing techniques uh, related to cultivar that this place can just use the black is one way to differentiate your uh, product in the future? Because I, I noticed that there are some cultivars that are emerging that need to be have a more controlled environmental um, agriculture circumstances. So, yeah, the question was, uh, are a lot of these growing practices varietal specific? And do those different varieties have sort of a different place in the market moving forward? And, and I absolutely think that they do. Uh, so you're starting to see more folks put research into CBG dominant varieties, into CBC dominant varieties. And that's, that's going to play a huge role in the market moving forward because CBD is commoditizing. Isolated CBG uh, is actually selling at a decent premium right now, but the cheapest way to get large amounts of CBG is not to isolate it out of the extract from um, CBD dominant varieties because you're talking about fractions of a percentage point as far as your yield off of that extraction. The, the cheapest way and the best way to commercialize those other cannabinoids is to go through a breeding process and get plants that are dominant in the, in the production of those cannabinoids. Now, I don't think that we're quite there yet, but it's coming. And I think, and I think that's a very good point to think about as you're thinking about your plan for your farm. Does that answer your question? All right. Yes, sir. Do you think um, indoor or greenhouse or controlled environment is better for the CBD production? So, uh, the question was, uh, is an indoor or greenhouse environment environment better for CBD production. And I'll, I'll tell you this, as far as controlling it for contaminants, uh, it, it's definitely beneficial, but it just costs us thinking much more. And as this continues to commoditize, now there's certain, there's certain market segments that are probably going to demand that indoor production, but they're very small market segments. If you can find one of those market segments that works for you and your farm, uh, then, then I'd say go for it. But with the cost of lighting, um, honestly, right now, if you're just selling to a company that's processing for CBD, it's it's probably not it's probably not profitable, uh, and it probably is going to get less profitable as as it continues to commoditize. Well, so so we don't we don't do uh, any kind of smokeable vent products. My company doesn't. But those products make up about 20% um, of the products that are on retail shel shelves in North Carolina right now. And when you're talking about a smokable product, it, it absolutely has to be produced in a controlled environment uh, to mitigate things like, you know, mold, mycotoxins, things like that. So it's much easier to control that in a greenhouse or better yet, a full-on uh, indoor grow facility than it is outdoors. Yes, sir. Is the uh, harvesting and drying process standardized, or is there an evolving methods? Um, Question was: Is the drying and harvesting process standardized, or is it evolving? And the the quick down and dirty answer is: It's definitely evolving. Uh, I can tell you what's working for us in North Carolina um, right now. There's not a lot of mechanization as far as the harvest is concerned. Most folks are cutting the plants by hand, but there is a significant amount of infrastructure, particularly in eastern North Carolina, um, that's been transferred from the tobacco industry into the hemp industry. So we have these things called bulk barns. And uh, what it is, is it's, it's, it's an, it looks like a shipping container, uh, but you're forcing air through the product, whether it be tobacco or hemp and you can add heat to it too. So with these tobacco barns, which are already on farm in North Carolina, um, you can take a crop that's 40% moisture in the field and dry it down to 8% moisture, which is optimal for our extraction methodology in about three days. Uh, and, and it really helps mitigate development of mold and things like that after you've harvested. Uh, we had a lot of guys our first year that tried to just hang it up uh, and let it dry naturally. And unfortunately, I think you guys have the same problem up here. Uh, the humidity 
is certainly not conducive to it, uh, and you develop a, quite a dramatic amount of mold. So really, now I've seen folks, I've seen folks do the same thing in a sweet potato curing facility. Works just as well. I, I can't tell you that one way of drying is better than the other. All I can give you is what's working for our growers, right? Now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh, they're putting whole plants in in these uh, tobacco barns, uh, and then they're stripping it post drying. It's a lot easier to strip the dry material than it is to strip the wet material. Yes, sir. That's, that's a real good question. Uh, I, I really, I don't know if you know the split as far as CBD versus grain and fiber. I tend to really just focus on the CBD economics. Um, I can tell you that I would assume that a dramatic amount of that 400,000 acres is for CBD, the vast majority of it. Um, because the markets just really haven't been developed for grain and fiber down here in the U.S. yet. You have some companies like Sunstrand uh, who has facilities up and running both in the U.S. and in Canada, and I think in Uruguay too, at this point, uh, that are working on commercializing fiber, but the markets just aren't there yet. Um, and excuse me, what was the second part of your question again? Oh, the contracts, the contracts. So we contracted out acreage across four states this year, and uh, we signed a binding contract with our growers that they, they will receive $3.50 Per percentage point of dry or per percentage point of CBD uh, by dry weight per pound of material that's given to us. Eight percent is considered dry. Yep, that's what those numbers are based on. Those numbers are based on our contract price. Yes, sir. Yeah, and and uh, that's that's a good if you have organic land. Uh, that is that is a good niche to go for. We did some certified organic uh, contracting this year, and it wasn't a multiple of that number. Uh, but I think some folks were sort of disappointed in the multiple because if you're talking about organic tobacco versus conventional tobacco, it's usually a 1.8x multiplier on the price. Well, ours ours wasn't anywhere near a 1.8x multiplier because essentially you're our production methodology, even if you're conventionally producing this crop, you're still using mostly organic practices. Really, really what we're paying a premium for is the certification on land. So it, it definitely was worthwhile and we got good participation in that, um, but it's it's nowhere near, you know, two times uh, the contracted price. Uh, 
I've seen I've seen some dehumidifiers used, but in those tobacco barns, if you're adding a little bit of heat and keeping the air, uh, the temperature of that air that you're forcing through the product about 10 degrees above ambient pressure, and not running the air when it's raining outside or something like that, uh, generally that's going to keep your humidity fairly low. One more question. One more question. Yes, ma'am. So, a very good question. Who's responsible for the transportation? And right now, the growers are responsible for the transportation. Um, what I can tell you is we're looking at logistical solutions to make that easier on growers. So, for instance, moving into a market like New York, right? Uh, just, just the same way that our partners do in tobacco, what we're looking at is setting up remote buying stations in those different markets that we're contracted in. We're not quite there yet. Uh, but I would assume that next year or the year after, as we continue to expand, uh, if we continue to expand, uh, that's going to be the model. Thank you all very much. I'll be around. Uh, come and find me. If you have any okay, we're going to kick off uh, our discussion of research uh, with two folks uh, working in my lab. Uh, they're going to tag team this presentation talking about uh, our results from our CBD hemp trial from last year and some of the concerns that you should have about uh, acquiring seed and uh, achieving uh, compliance for THC. Uh, so, is George going first? George Stack uh, just graduated with his Bachelor of Science from Cornell. So he's actually talking about uh, work that he did as an undergraduate in my lab. And he will tag team with uh, Jacob Toth, who is a new PhD student. Uh, George also is about to start his PhD. Uh, so George, uh, so they are working off of the handout that we gave out, the uh, 2018 uh, cannabinoid production handout. Okay, George. All right, uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, yeah, so Jacob and I are going to be talking about uh, two, well, actually three sets of trials that we conducted uh, last summer. Last summer? This is better? Okay. Um, that we conducted last summer um, across New York State uh, and that we ended up quantifying cannabinoids for. Um, so we'll, we'll break down those two sets of trials, two major sets of trials first. Um, one was the brain fiber and dual purpose trial, um, which had 33 different varieties from um, the United States, uh, Canada, and Europe in it. It was replicated six times across the state. It's the, the yellow dots on the map there. Um, so twice in Geneva, twice in Ithaca, once in Chazy, and once down in Long Island at Riverhead. So we covered the entire uh, latitudinal range of New York State. And you'll hear more about that um, from Jamie this afternoon. Um, and that was planted, uh, direct seeded with a, a small plot grain drill, four reps, uh, blocked into uh, early maturing grain, uh, dual purpose grain and fiber varieties, and um, later maturing fiber varieties. Um, that was planted in the middle of June and harvested throughout September. Uh, the other major set of trials that we did was a cannabinoid trial, which was uh, replicated twice, once in uh, Geneva and once in Ithaca. So those were Trans started in the greenhouse and transplanted into black plastic. There was 15 different varieties started in that trial. Um, they were started from mixed male and female seeds. Um, all of the plants were transplanted into the field and then the males were called out in the field. Um, and then towards the end of the, the year, once the plants were flowering, we collected uh, floral tissue for cannabinoid analysis. And there was kind of three different reasons we did that. One was to measure THC, which is um, important for staying at a regulatory levels. Uh, the other measuring CBD, which is important because that's your bottom line, that's what you're going to get paid for. And then the third was uh, measuring other minor cannabinoids, which kind of Scott alluded to in his talk, um, to see if there was any potential for lines that would be better at producing those minor cannabinoids. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Jacob to talk about our HPLC and cannabinoid analysis. Thank you, George. So as George was mentioning, we use HPLC to measure the cannabinoids for our, our various different entries. Uh, we tested CBD, THC, CBC, CBG, 
and their corresponding acids. We also tested delta H, THC, and CBN, but we didn't find any of those cannabinoids in any of our samples. Uh, to calculate the total potential, we multiplied the corresponding acid form of either THC or CBD by 0.877, and that's what's shown in the bar plot at the bottom of the page. Um, so for the grain fiber and dual, uh, these are sort of representative samples from 10 plants, 10 female plants that we harvested, uh, while the CBD and pollination trials were the averages of individual plants. Um, as you can see, we had some grain fiber and dual uh, cultivars that tested above the uh, legal limit of 0.3 THC. Uh, the dotted line there uh, is 0.3 total potential THC. And if you look at our CBD varieties, everything tested hot. So looking at the individual plants in the CBD trial, uh, we found three distinct groups. If you plotted the total potential THC versus total potential CBD, and that's in the scatter plot in the other bottom corner. Uh, the first group is uh, in red, and it was mostly THC, very little CBD. Uh, we're calling that the marijuana type. Uh, the second group in green had about equal amounts of THC and CBD. Uh, we're calling that the heterozygous type. And then the third group in blue is about 20 to 25 to 1 CBD to THC. Using uh, published genetic data on the gene sequences of the cannabinoid synthases, we were able to develop a molecular marker which mapped on directly to these three groups, and that's what gives you the color there. Um, so what we can say is summarized in the first paragraph, it looks like the marijuana types have two marijuana copies, the heterozygotes have one marijuana copy, one hemp copy, and then the hemp types have two hemp copies. So what was really interesting here is that we found a pretty consistent 20 to 25 to 1 ratio in the hemp type. Uh, so that means if we're going for a 0.3% total potential THC, we can't get much over around 6 or 7% total CBD without getting above 0.3% total potential THC, which is potentially a very large problem. Um, so with this molecular marker, one thing that we found that was very interesting uh, was that we found these heterozygotes in nearly every cultivar that we tested. Um, we only tested a few cultivars, and they're listed on the back, uh, but we had, I don't think there's any reason to suspect that those are special in being the only cultivars that are going to be segregating for this marijuana-type cannabinoid synthase. Um, in any case, it's going to be a future breeding effort of ours to make sure that all future hemp varieties are going to be actual hemp and not have any marijuana-type cannabinoid synthases. And here's George to talk about the pollination study. Uh, yeah, so the, the third uh, trial that we did um, was just in Geneva last, last summer. And we were looking at how um, distance from a pollen source affected cannabinoid content, which is a pretty important concern. I'm sure many of you are familiar that um, there's anecdotal evidence that once uh, cannabis plants are pollinated, their levels of cannabinoids go down dramatically. Um, so we decided to conduct this trial last year to, to gauge maybe how far or how much of a, of a decrease farmers could expect if there was a pollen source uh, near their field. Um, so what we did is we planted a three-acre plot of a monoecious uh, dual-purpose grain and fiber variety called Anka. Uh, you can see that in the center of the map on the back of your hand out there. Um, and then we put many smaller micro plots um, in the four cardinal directions around the plot. So we had the controls, uh, a ring at 200, some at around 500, one at 1500, and then our, our cannabinoid uh, CBD trial um, was not on the map, but uh, a further away control. Um, so now I'll point you down to uh, the nice scatter plots on the bottom. Um, so the first one on the left, you can see as uh, the distance from the pollen source increased, the number of seeds decreased, which is what we expected. It means that um, less pollen was probably getting to those plots that were further away. They were getting less pollinated. Uh, the middle plot there, as the number of seeds on a plant increased, the total potential CBD decreased. Another thing that we expected, you know, as the plants got more pollinated, they had lower levels of cannabinoids. And then um, 
the last uh, chart on the left there, as distance from the pollen source increased, total potential CBD increased. Um, so the plants that were further away got less pollinated at higher cannabinoid levels. Uh, you see we had a little blip at our 1500 plot because a lot of them were stolen. So <laughs> <laughs> may have affected the line, but you know, general upward trend there. Um, Alrighty, so Jacob and I would happy to, uh, be happy to take any questions about any of our trials that we did last year. <laughs> Yeah, so we were doing our uh, testing based on the regulatory standard for New York State, which is the top 10 centimeters of a, a floral tissue on the plant. Um, we dried that in a greenhouse and then homogenized it in a uh, Nutribullet and then we sent it to the HPLC. Yep. I know that in regular generation you have your sativa, your sativa, your hybrid. Is that sort of how that ends up in the plant? It doesn't actually. Uh, oh, uh, so the question was, does the, uh, the grouping at all match in the cover versus sativa? Um, so we, we aren't really concerned in a reading context or testing about in the cover versus sativa. Um, I think the most recent genetic evidence suggests that those aren't truly taxonomically relevant. Um, but the grouping here, uh, it was a lot of within cultivar variation. Some cultivars did have more heterozygotes than others, um, but within nearly every cultivar, we had some segregation. Um, I should also make a point here when talking about the total potential. Uh, just looking at delta 9 THC alone, not looking at total potential, everything in the blue group was well below. Um, about half of the green group was below. And then the marijuana type reds were always above. Yes? The, the, the testing, is it for total THC or just delta 9? So we, we tested for delta 9, delta 8, and uh, THCA. And what's on the handout is total potential, which is delta 9 plus 0 0.877 times THCA. That's the regulatory standard in New York? It is now, yes. It wasn't last year, but it is now. Did I hear you correctly then that if you're above seven percent CBD, then you're not you're you're over the threshold by THC? That's what we found in last year's study. That's not necessarily the case for every plant. Um, there are some cultivars that we haven't tried, uh, but everything that we've seen has a ratio of around 20 to 25. Some go up to 27, but we didn't see much higher of a ratio than that. What we were generally talking before is 8% of the level, so we can't go. Uh, I have no comment on that. <laughs> so, so the question is, uh, at what point do you request the regulatory sampling, okay? You have to be compliant at the time of the regulatory sampling. And then you harvest up to three weeks after that. And the levels will accumulate after that regulatory sample is collected. But Jacob uh, is making an excellent point. Uh, it is the ratio of CBD to THC that is critical. And we are seeing, at best, a 25 to one ratio so, if you go for a 12.5% CBD crop, you're at 0.5% THC and you're non-compliant. So my recommendation would be, don't get greedy. Don't get greedy. Test regularly, ask for the regulatory sample at the proper time, so that you stay compliant. One more question. Do you happen to know, and this might not fall into this research category, but say you went through the whole season, you did everything as per regulation state, and you were just above that threshold at the very end point, so your crop is a loss at that point. Is there anything in place that could potentially use that crop for fiber or anything otherwise, or it's just, sorry, see you next year? 
So the question is, if you are above the, the legal regulatory level, is there anything you can do with that crop? Yes. And the answer is no, it's going to be seized and destroyed. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Jacob and George. You did a great job. be referring to this handout. Uh, the title is Evaluating Disease Resistance in CBD Hemp Cultivars. Um, so if you're having trouble finding it, so yeah. it's the one if you're having trouble finding it, it's the one with a lot of authors because we had a lot of great people working on this project, besides just me. So um, one of the uh, major diseases that we're interested in in hemp is uh, powdery mildew. So this disease is caused by a fungal pathogen. It shows up as these uh, white spores, these patches on the leaves, um, which you can see in figure one. Um, and the, these patches can spread and uh, go on to the flowers and kind of reduce your flower bud quality, um, which you can see in figure two. Um, and then figure three and four are just zoomed in versions of those spores um, that are causing uh, this disease. So uh, right now, there isn't really uh, uh, established disease management for powdery mildew. It's something that we're working on right now. There aren't any uh, approved fungicides, uh, but that's also something we're working on. So, but another way that we're working on this is looking for resistance. So we evaluated 30 high CBD um, cultivars uh, to look for resistance against powdery mildew. So that is shown in at the bottom of the page. Um, so we, from these 30 cultivars, we took three leaves from each of the cultivars and inoculated them with the powdery mildew in the lab. And then we rated for disease severity um, by looking at them under the microscope and counting height feed. Um, and our results you can see in the graph in figure five. So we saw some differences. Um, there are certainly some cultivars that are more susceptible to the powdery. And this is something that we're going to continue to do with more um, cultivars. Uh, right now, we're doing a screening with uh, grain and fiber cultivars. So that's something that we're going to continue to work on. Um, so, if, so that's what we've done so far. And if you turn to the back, there is, um, we're talking about cross infectivity with hop powdery mildew and hemp powdery mildew. So you might be thinking, why are we talking about hop powder in the This is hemp field day, right? Well, uh, hop is actually the most closely related crop species to hemp. And it has its own powder mildew caused by a completely different genus and species of fungus. And you can see a uh, hop uh, leaf infected with powder mildew in figure six. And figure seven is also a um, hop, it's a hop uh, flower or cone and also infected with powdery mildew. So we were wondering, because these crops are so closely related, can their powdery mildews infect each other? So is hemp powdery mildew a threat to hop? And in figure eight, you can kind of see that hop, uh, hemp powdery mildew doesn't really grow that great. On, um, hemp powdery mildew does not grow great on hop. So yes, that's very confusing. <laughs> So it doesn't seem like hemp powdery mildew is going to be that big of a threat to hops, but in figure 9 you can see that hop powdery mildew grows quite well on this particular cultivar of hemp, Inca. So that is something that we are interested in looking into further. Um, is there any resistance in hemp to both hemp powdery mildew and hop powdery mildew? Um, are there any uh, resistant genes? and if so, which cultivars are resistant, and how can we incorporate that into the breeding program? So, I'll take any questions. There, oh, the question is, is there anything that can be sprayed for this right now? And the answer is no, there's no nothing that is approved right now to be sprayed. Um, that's something that is being worked on. Um, so I, along with the Department of Ag and Markets, have been working with the New York State um, DEC 
and uh, about two weeks ago we had a phone call with them and they are working to create a list of products that will be legal to use on hemp and I asked if that list would be ready this season and the response was when does the season end? <laughs> Um, but uh, it, I have to say it was a really productive conversation. The DEC understands the need um, for both organic and conventional products, uh, the need for products to be used in disease control, and, um, and I think they are working on a list of products that will be available um, for use, hopefully before the end of this season, um, and not that it's entirely helpful, but certainly by next season. Now you said it's a completely different genus and species that creates it on the hop plant versus the hemp plant. Is there a possibility that it's just because this plant isn't grown out here at all and that this other genus that's usually bad for the hops could potentially, once this crop becomes more mainstream, kind of adapt and become an issue since they're so closely related? Um. <laughs> so, yes, yes, the <laughs> short answer is yes. yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, pathogens are really adaptable, that's what they're good at. Right. And absolutely, uh, if you have a larger target area, um, and you know, powdery mildew makes millions and millions and millions of spores every year, um, of course the possibility exists. Uh, right now, we primarily have seen hemp powdery mildew in greenhouse scenarios and not as often in the field. Um, but having said that, um, if any of you have seen powdery mildew in your hemp field, uh, I, we would love to have, well we, Allie would love to have a sample. <laughs> um, uh, what we wanna do is look at the diversity of this pathogen across New York and across the country um, to see if, if, you know, how similar it is, how diverse it is, and, and um, in, our, in our search, let me rephrase, in Allie's search for resistance, um, it, we want to make sure that if a cultivar is resistant to one strain, we know uh, if it's resistant to all of the strains or if it's strain specific to the powder mill. So that's something that we're going to be looking into. So we haven't uh, collected for CBD uh, yet this year. So that's something that we will be looking into. Yeah. So these are plants that were that are being that you'll see that are being grown in the field right now. Yeah. So we haven't harvested them yet. So next year maybe we'll have that information. <laughs> always tells you five years. <laughs> Larry, five years? Yeah, five years. <laughs> Three to five years. <laughs> so it depends on the uh, uh, genetic mechanisms of resistance. So we, we have two, broadly, two mechanisms of resistance. If it's a single gene that's conferring resistance, that single gene can be fairly easy to incorporate into a leaf cultivar. Uh, if it's a multigenic mechanism, uh, that can be very challenging, a very long-term process, but that mechanism is more stable in its long-term resistance. But yeah, three to five years. Uh, one, one other thing I should mention that Allie is doing that she didn't bring up is um, we are we here on research land testing uh, different products and I'm spraying them on plants uh, that may be approved for use in the future to see if there is phytotoxicity, but also to see if any of the products that may be approved cause modifications in THC or CBD levels, because really nothing is known about, I mean, even if you use an organic product, which frequently are living bacteria that secrete antibiotics that kill powdery mildew, we don't know what that does to THC or CBD concentration in the flowers, so that's one of the important things that Allie will be looking at as well. And in the back. 
Um, are, are you seeing any evidence or tracking mites at this point? Um, question is, are we tracking mites? And we, we do see mites in the field for sure. And they're probably, I'm not sure if there are people that are tracking. No. Um, yes, at least from what I've seen, I have not seen cultivar differentiation. Our schedule today, Dennis Willett, who is a new assistant professor in the Department of Entomology here at Cornell Agritech. Unfortunately, he fell ill this morning and is in the hospital. Uh, so, Camelia Gilgaris uh, in his lab is, uh, we're handing out her uh, handout right now, and we'll talk about uh, the work in Dennis's lab to characterize secondary products and uh, terpenes. Camelia. using chemicals and uh, why I'm here because those chemicals uh, including terpenes are very important for understand those communications why terpenes terpenes are small molecules and they are important for two reasons the first reason uh, it's for plant defense they are very important to understand and the plants can defend against insects or pathogens or stress. And the other thing that is very important and the terpenes influence a lot of plants, including hemp, is uh, the smell and taste. So in our lab, we try to quantify and identify the compounds and the terpenes, how much we have in the plants, and um, how those amounts or how the mix with compounds can influence the response. Now we are doing some work with Chris Smart and Larry Smart when we are trying to understand which compound, which terpenes are involved for the ham, um, for the taste and the smell of the rim because it is something very important and how this can influence the pathogens and the plants defense with insects and stress. For to do this, we just collect some plant samples, can be the whole plant or we just collect the air around the plant and bring those samples to the lab. We have the NAS spectro or um, the chromatography when we analyze those chemicals and we can quantify and identify all those compounds. With this we can test those compounds and we can see exactly what which one is influenced the, the results or the preference or um, the defense. Basically the idea with our work with the, the hemp just started with this and test the importance of those terpenes on the, the uh, on the back here we have some examples with terpenes that we can find at the hemp plants and I bring some vials with different kind of terpenes if you guys are interested to smell and see the difference uh, I don't think you guys will smell exactly the same smell for the rim because normally it's a combination with different compounds so, if you guys are interested, I can show you guys this. Thank you. Which terpenes were identified for plant defense? We can identify different numbers of terpenes. Sometimes, uh, the most of the times when we take the sample from the plants, we have no idea. We are trying to figure out the terpenes that we can find. And with this, we can synthesize those terpenes and test those terpenes against whatever we want to or smell or taste. Do you have an identifier? Uh, the ham, we are 
at this list on the back have some terpenes that we can find at the end. Yeah. But and we are working with some species now, but we don't have exactly the terpenes, specific ones. Is the thought that you'll identify the terpene that repels specific insects and then genetically create, you know, um, a seed that a plant that can descend naturally? Yeah, our goal is trying to identify some terpenes that can be useful for the pest control, yes. Uh, normally it's not just one, it's a combination. And uh, we have different ways that we can apply those terpenes on the plants. It can be a genetic thing or it can be just directly spray on the plants and this plant can synthesize or you can stimulate the plants to produce those terpenes. So you're thinking synthetic? Yeah, now our idea is just to ident identify first and after that try to stimulate the plants to do something. Okay. And help. we can use the genetic things to do or we can do use the different ways. Is there any correlation between certain terpenes and uh, an abnormal expression? Good question. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Yeah, I don't want to, yeah. What was the question? Uh, so the question is, are there correlations between particular terpenes and uh, particular cannabinoids? And there was a very nice paper done at Washington State that was just published a couple of months ago to characterize that. And if I'm trying to remember, Jacob might remember better than I, uh, I do not recall that they saw specific correlations between particular terpenes and particular cannabinoids. Those were in marijuana types. It's why we are testing different species too. We want to understand better. Uh, you know, if the protein play has any role in enhancing the effect of CBD? Uh, I, I, think, I don't think have something that we do, we don't do anything with this yet. We are just working with the basic things and try to identify the terpenes. But I'm sure we'll be the some next step. Okay, thanks very much for more. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.